Bienvenue, bonjour tout le monde. Thank you everyone for coming to the 35th event of Disrupting Disruptions, the Feminist and Accessible Publishing, Communications and Technologies Practices Speaker and Workshop Series. I'm Dr. Alex Ketchum and I'm a professor of feminist and social justice studies at McGill University and the organizer of this series. The Feminist and Accessible Publishing, Communications and Technologies Practices Speaker and Workshop Series seeks to bring together scholars, creators and people in industry working at the intersections of digital humanities, computer science, feminist studies, disability studies, communication studies, LGBTQ studies, history, and critical race theory. We are hosting 12 free virtual and professionally captioned events this winter, and you're welcome to join us at all of them. You can find our full schedule as well as video recordings of our past events at disruptingdisruptions.com. That's the redirect URL because the other URL is way too long to remember. You can also find our list of sponsors, including SHRC, the IGSF, MILU, and the Indigenous Futures Lab. The next event is on March 3rd. Hione Mahalona and Peter Lucas Jones will be speaking about Indigenous data sovereignty. They're joining us virtually from New Zealand. On March 10th, Morgan Kloss Shurman will be speaking about computer vision in a talk entitled, How We Teach Computer Vision to See Race and Gender. So we hope you join us at those events as well. Past series speakers, Susan Kite and Jess McLean have pointed to the physical and material impacts of the digital world. While the events this semester are virtual, everything that we do is tied to the land and the space that we are on. We must always be mindful of the lands that the servers enabling our virtual events are on. Furthermore, as the series seeks to draw attention to power relations that have been invisibilized, it is important to acknowledge Canada's long colonial history and current political practices. This series is affiliated with the Institute for Gender, Sexuality, and Feminist Studies of McGill University. We are currently located in Jijoge, Montreal, an unceded Ghanaian-Gahaga territory. Furthermore, the ongoing efforts, organizing efforts by the Wessawodan people at the Unistodan camp make clear the ever-present and ongoing colonial violence in Canada. Interwoven with this history of colonization is one of enslavement and racism. This university's namesake, James McGill, enslaved Black and Indigenous peoples. It was in part from the money he acquired through these violent acts that McGill University was founded. These histories are here with us in this space and inform the conversations we have today. I encourage you to learn more about the lands that you are on. NativeLand.ca is a fantastic resource for doing so. For this event, recording is enabled, so the event can be embedded on our website. Don't worry, only the speakers will be shown in the video. We also have a Q&A option available. So throughout the talk, you may type your questions in the Q&A answer box, and there'll be some time at the end for Anna to answer them. We can't guarantee that every question will be answered, but we are grateful to the discussion that you generate. Now for today's event. I now have the pleasure of introducing Anna Brendusescu. Currently, as the 2019 to 2021 McConnell Professor of Practice at McGill University Center for Interdisciplinary Research on Montreal, Anna Brandusescu is examining public events in AI across Canada and in Montreal. Anna is co-leading AI for the Rest of Us, a research project to develop a new model of public civic engagement in governmental decision-making processes that are being automated with AI. Anna advises on the design of an AI risk assessment tool and serves on Canada's multi-stakeholder forum on open government. She is on the advisory board of Learning from Small Cities and is a member of At Open Heroines. So please join me in welcoming Anna. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for that introduction, Alex, and for having me. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and share my screen. It's all good? Perfect. All right. So um, I am truly honored to be here and a part of this series. Uh, thank you, Alex, for having me and also for being a part of this research. Um, this is really exciting because it's the first time I'll be talking about this uh, research publicly. So just a brief background on this, because uh, there's a lot to talk about, but I also want to hear from you. Um, so hopefully this won't be that long. I spend a lot of time at the intersection of government and civil society, um, but I am more interested now in uh, researching government and industry. So hence looking at funding AI in Canada, um, public investments, private interests. 
So what is the research about? Well, I've started this research back in the fall of 2019, um, and it started off with um, looking at the, a broader lens of the governments of AI, uh, where I held 53 interviews with Canada-based experts, um, which included government officials, industry researchers and analysts, uh, legal practitioners, nonprofit practitioners, human rights advocates, and academics working in or adjacent to the AI landscape. So this work was, um, was basically condensed in this one presentation and this report that's coming out around examining and understanding the AI policy and government funding in Canada. And it's really about bringing awareness uh, to the funding and open data um, landscape, especially uh, finance and having data sets open, but also to have published research openly that people can use and build on as well. So the importance of this is that we are looking at long-term goals to find collective ways to, to question, change, and improve policy and regulation for AI technologies. So why AI funding? Well, AI funding reveals how governments are building the innovation economy, who they invest in the most, and who they invest in the least. Um, it addresses a specific part of AI governance that doesn't get enough attention. And it brings understanding to why governments continue to fund AI technologies that cause harm and exacerbate structural bias. So I'm going to give a quick shout out to other series speakers and authors who have written about these issues with AI in replicating and amplifying racism, sexism, classism, ableism, and its structural inequalities. I recommend reading their work and also Data Feminism by Catherine D'Ignazio and Lauren Klein, um, as well as Gender Shades by scholars Timnit Gebru, Joy Bolamuni, and Deborah Raji. But back to the status quo in Canada. So there are definitely geopolitics involved and who funds leads. Um, and we see this at the global scale with a global AI race that is supporting the tech innovation economy, uh, largely China, US, Singapore, UK, and France. Um, that really show how much amounts have um, amounts as in funding and, and money has been poured into uh, AI. And funding is about power, control, and opacity. Um, and we see opacity in AI technologies as well as in their funding networks. There's con increasing concern over how AI is governed and the way that it is funded. Um, an AI industry that is being built without taking into account human rights and collective rights. So as of August 2020, um, we've seen billions of dollars that have been committed to, to AI in Canada. Uh, the first number, 1 billion in government contributions awarded across the country, 1.2 billion of planned government investments uh, that were publicly announced for the province of Quebec, and $2 billion in private investments reported in Montreal. The 2 billion amount is an aggregate number that we don't have the details of um, because the data is closed, but it's important to kind of give you an idea of how much money has been um, invested in AI in just one single city. So first, a little bit about the ecosystem. So who's a part of it? Uh, well, there are many actors, um, especially from private uh, entities such as venture capital funds, angel investors, institutional investors, startups, uh, big tech companies, big consulting and audit firms, incubators and accelerators that are also found in the public sphere. Uh, those are also linked to academic labs and initiatives um, and projects as well as nonprofits and government institutions. So there's a lot of, uh, there are a lot of people involved. Okay, so, there are various maps of ecosystems of the AI uh, and the way they unfold in Canada, but there's no data set around who these actors are. You have a lot of logos um, and PDFs. Um, so coming back from a, you know, a background of open data and open government, I decided to um, put together one major data set that uh, includes all of these entities. So um, Elisa Kyle 
and I worked on this and, and launched it in July of last year, where we had 710 public and private entities um, that we listed in this spreadsheet available at that URL that's open for feedback and ideas. And as you can see, um, there's also details around the sources um, and who kind of helped uh, put this together. So now onto AI policy. Who is involved in it? Well, there's lots of actors and this part, I mean, the policy people on this presentation will enjoy this part. I would say that sometimes it can be a little dry, but I want to kind of go through, walk through all of the different departments and agencies with you because I think it's important to know who's who and who makes the decisions. Uh, so I'll start off with Treasury Board of Canada Secretariat, TBS, um, that creates and leads on AI policy in the federal government, provides leadership on digital government as well as open government. There's also Innovation Science and Development Canada, also known as ISAD, uh, who coordinates the Pan-Canadian AI strategy uh, the AI Supercluster Initiative and international partnerships. And all of those three points are very important for the way that AI is being rolled out in Canada. Um, they're also uh, coordinating with CIFAR, which is the Canadian Institute for Advanced Research um, that is leading the Pan-Canadian AI research strategy for Canada. We also have the Public Services and Procurement Canada uh, that leads procurement across the government and including procurement of AI. Uh, Justice Canada reviews and provides legal opinions on law and AI, and Global Affairs Canada sets the international AI policy agenda. We also have these other departments and agencies that are also very important um, because they play an important role in terms of contracts. So a lot of contracts, um, they are in charge of awarding to different um, vendors and entities uh, and organizations. So notably, National Defense and National Research Council award a lot of contracts in AI-related work. So within that, I've spoken briefly about CIFAR, and I think it's really important to go into it because they are the um, ones that lead the pan-Canadian AI uh, strategy. Uh, we have a concentration of research and activity in the three major AI research institutes um, in Montreal, which is Mila, Toronto, Vector Institute, and Edmonton Amy. So the institutes are aggressively poaching top AI talent to become um, CIFAR AI chairs uh, through a designated $66 million fund that um, is uh, active until 2024. Um, they, CIFAR does a lot of other things, uh, but its public-private funding mechanism is used to connect researchers and people. As such, Yashra Bengio, Jeffrey Hinton, and Richard Sutton were selected very quickly to manage the funds uh, for these three main research institutes in Canada. So on to global AI policy. Um, it's important to look at AI, global AI policy because it really helped shape Canada's national AI policy. Um, I said specifically held two important international convenings to create global AI policy that influenced uh, the work uh, at the national level. First in June, 2018 with the G7 um, and then the G7 kind of carries on throughout of uh, December, 2018 and May of the following year. So it's important to look at three things. One, the Charlevoix common vision for the future of AI, um, the mandate for global partnership on AI GPay um, that has been recently uh, launched in um, December of last year. Uh, and it's the Canada and France's vision of human-centric AI. Um, and also looking at the conference on AI in Montreal that was Organized, um, organized by ISAID and held by Element AI with industry, academia, nonprofit, and government representatives. Um, and last but not least, the Declaration and Structure of 
or structural organization of GPE um, that was um, put together at the G7 digital minister meeting. Uh, and the most the one creation of the advisory council on AI that was co-chaired again with industry. So from that, we could see Canada's responsible use of AI government shaping up. Um, and this can, is a, they took that language from global AI policy and, and took it um, to this landing page um, on TBS website, uh, which includes a set of guiding principles, the directive on automated decision-making, a timeline on that directive, um, as well as a list of the pre-qualified AI suppliers, the algorithmic impact assessment, AIA that I will speak more about, and the Government of Canada's Strategic Plan for Information Management and Information Technology 2017 to 2021. And that is a very long name, but it's super important because that's where Canada's AI strategy currently is under. So the directive on ADM, this is the closest thing to law we have when it comes to AI in Canada. And um, it, was, it was put together and launched on April 2020 to ensure that ADM systems are deployed in a matter that reduces risk to Canadians and federal institutions and leads to more efficient, accurate, consistent, and interpretable decisions made pursuant to Canadian law. Um, there's no mention of accountability responsibility. However, I'm sure we cannot include all the words, but it's just interesting to see what language is used uh, when describing the directive. The compliance with the directive is required and applies to any ADM system developed or procured by government um, after April of last year. Uh, so the, the, digi the digital government strategy is supported by two major policies that guide how right technologies are implemented. Uh, so you have the directive on ADM and the AIA that both under the TBS, um, which is the main departed that shapes how these technologies are governed. There's no directive for how ADM systems should be used in the private sector, which is something to note. Again, this is still outside of the scope um, of government, but related to it since government uh, procures to um, private sector. So along with um, the ADM directive, we have the AIA, uh, which is 60 questions on the business process, data system design decisions made, um, and that determine how acceptable an AI solution is from an ethical perspective. Uh, it, the AIA is made primarily for people who design and build AI systems, um, and it's about creating public facing data set of what is automated and why to be able to shine a light on ADM systems. So this is kind of like the long-term goal of the AIA. Um, and it's also about trying to have a clear method on how the directive would apply to different AI systems through the AIA, through the questions that the AIA asks. So now onto funding. Okay, so there are two uh, Government of Canada funding streams for AI that I analyzed. The first is grants and contributions. So grants are awarded unconditionally based on certain funding criteria. Uh, contributions are awarded to recipients based on an expectation of performance. Uh, so just to make a note that the most of the awards in AI have gone to contributions and that makes sense in this context, about 99% of the ones that I found. Um, and second, the contracts are awarded to entities that have to deliver a good or a service. So the reason that these streams are divided like this, it's because within the open data portal uh, of the government, that's how they're divided. You have a database for grants and contributions and you have one for contracts. Just a, a, a very like simplified explanation of that. Okay, so I'm not giving you anything fancy here, uh, but that will, this looks a lot better in the report and, and the other things that will come out with this research. But here it is, um, the total value of government of Canada AI grants and contributions by province and territory. So um, we analyzed a total of 1322 awards, so 1,322 awards from September 2007 to June 2020 uh, that totaled 
1.1 billion dollars. Um, as you can see, the top provinces um, that got the most uh, funding have, were Quebec, British Columbia, and Ontario. Um, and to derive this data set, uh, the AI specific keywords that were used were artificial intelligence, AI, ADM, machine learning, and deep learning. Um, just to note that the other category is actually foreign and international awards, which is not a lot, 119,000 compared to the top um, award total for Quebec, 472 million. So we also looked at um, these values by stakeholder group. Uh, to no one's surprise, for-profit organizations got the most funding, uh, 794 million. Um, and academia and the nonprofit sector got roughly the same. All of this data can be searchable on, on these links. I will share these slides. So you can go ahead and look at each one. Uh, uh, in more depth, in, in more depth. So well, who are the top 10 funded entities by the Canadian government? We have uh, these 10. The first four are all supercluster initiatives. So they're the top four awards. Uh, just a note that the superclusters, uh, that was a $950 million investment. Uh, so we can see that this is really showing up in these numbers. We also have startups um, like North Inc, uh, Element AI, and MindBridge, Mindbridge Analytics um, that got some of the major awards, as well as a few universities. Uh, so out of the, the data sets that give you a lot more columns, this is cleaning it up to kind of see, you know, what is scale AI, understand again, what they wrote for the project and product description to get a better sense of what they'll be working with. It's still high level, but it gives you a little bit, arguably more focus and detail than their website, for example. Uh, so who awards the most AI grants and contributions? What we found is that the National Research Council of Canada has by far the most um, awards. Um, they're not the biggest, but they're definitely the most, 847 awards. Uh, Natural Sciences and Engineering Research Council of Canada, NSERC, uh, comes at second at 303, which is less than half of what uh, National Research Council of Canada grants. And, and then even less than that is the Canadian Institutes of Health Research at 51. So again, even though the uh, these top uh, agencies and departments give out the most amount of grants, who, amount, who awards the highest amount in terms of dollars is definitely ISAD. Okay, so switching from grants and contributions to Government of Canada a contract. Uh, contracts are different from grants and contributions and um, Although nonetheless, it's important to see what can we find on the open data portal on, on them. Uh, and actually, to my surprise, there is just not so much available. Um, there are 93 contracts, total value of $50 million from 2006 to June 2020. And this is also because a lot of those contracts are not searchable by keywords. They're actually searchable by the, uh, the name of the company. So because of that, public procurement is super important. And I know maybe some of you will be like, roll your eyes because, oh, no, it's not. It's super boring. Or some of you know me and you're like, oh, of course, you'll be excited about this. But here's me trying to convince you that procurement is not only really important, but it provides a lot of, in terms of accountability or unaccountability in the way this um, AI gets rolled out. So here is a really important slide because it shows you uh, the list of pre-qualified AI suppliers from the government of Canada um, in this visualization. So you have, what's important to look at here is the categories, the companies, and the bands. So first, the categories. As you see at the top, you have consulting, 
firms, AI platforms, firms, data and analytics, AI applications, and IT solutions. So all of this is AI, even though AI is only mentioned specifically in two of the five categories. And then I know that's being pedantic, but it isn't at the same time, because then things like this become searchable or unsearchable on the open data portal, for example. Uh, now the bands are important because you, as you could see is band three is where most of them sit is that means that you can uh, hire a company for up to $9 million uh, per contract. So I'm going to come back to some of these uh, companies, but uh, we'll move on for now. So just like I said, AI isn't only AI, it's AI becomes IT within the way the government categorizes it. Um, as we can see, the most um, pre-qualified AI suppliers are based on these sectors uh, that are created by, um, by the government as, as you know, building software or doing consulting. So these companies are categorized by sector based on the type of technology on which they build or create services for rather than the domain for which it is intended. So, IT sector instead of health sector. And you can see the majority is in AI services and solutions and IT services and solutions. Uh, so where are all these uh, pre-qualified AI suppliers located? Well, most of them are in Ontario. That's not a surprise, but the surprise is the second number, which is in internationally. Um, even though a lot of funding is going on to, um, you don't see that um, exemplified here. So going back to looking at the pre-qualified list, um, and I thought it would be important to look at who the top five tech vendors for government are. Um, because even though these vendors are not AI first, they use AI in their products and services. So not surprisingly, maybe IBM Canada is number one um, with $12.3 billion across you know, almost 20 years. Uh, then you have Calian with 3 billion, Microsoft Canada at 2.7 billion, Talos Canada at 1.8 billion, and CGI information systems and management consultants at 1.2 billion. Um, what we see is this longstanding relationship between government and these firms. Um, and again, these are not all just AI contracts, but it's just to kind of show the importance of um, priority um, and that, the, that some of these companies get, uh, and perhaps a kind of monopoly that they form. Uh, Noteworthy is the Canadian government's investment in IBM Canada um, because of the company's, uh, you know, relationship over the last 18 years. And again, all contracts of the vendors um, data sets are available for anyone to look at and explore and work with and build on. So AI in Quebec and Montreal, um, briefly, I won't go through this. Um, I have an interactive Mac map made of this uh, that will let you ex examine and explore it more, um, which I will, it will be linked in the report as well, which, which basically starts to put together the pieces of, um, you know, all of these connections and then the system coming from the, the government of Canada all the way through the province and then to Montreal. Um, so the governmental and geopolitical influence is ever present in the need to position Montreal and Quebec in the global information economy. To this extent, AI has become a key facet of Quebec's economic strategy and have invested heavily in it. The media and public opinion has also plays a role in shaping the narrative of Montreal as an AI forward city, a type of new Silicon Valley. So with that, in 2017, the Montreal Declaration for the Development of Responsible AI was put together, led by the University de Montréal, 
to champion AI ethics. Um, it was comprised of a niche group represented by public facing figures in the city's um, AI scene. Um, and it, but its principles leave much room for interpretation with no legal enforcement leaving accountability of AI technologies and its actors unknown. So series speaker and legal researcher Yuan Stevens presented critical research on the Montreal AI scene and its influence on the global AI industry um, a year ago, exactly. Um, and I recommend her work deeply. So back to the strategy um, in terms of Quebec, the government and what, uh, what happened you know, after the Montreal uh, Declaration was put together. Well, um, a year after the declaration in 2018, you had a strategy rolled out uh, with its main goals to maintain Quebec's academic leadership, to develop talent, support technology transfer and marketing, develop a center of expertise in responsible AI, and develop robust support structures. Um, again, it's about investing in AI and data scientists with specific support uh, to Ivado um, and Scale AI, again, one of those um, super clusters. What was interesting about this strategy was reading that the government prefers to use the term ecosystem instead of cluster as AI permeates many industries and is found across many sectors. These sectors include government services to banking and finance, health, retail, and manufacturing, and hence why the opacity of AI is so easy to maintain. Uh, bringing it to the pandemic and current times, um, in May 2020, Quebec announces a special pilot program for the immigration of healthcare professionals under the Quebec Experience Program. And at the same time, another pilot program was announced um, on for AI workers specifically, but there was not many, not much public detail about it. Um, and a few months later in the fall, um, Quebec ended up publishing a draft reg regulation for implementing these three new permanent immigration pilot programs, uh, one of which was uh, that included AI besides IT and visual effects sectors. So um, even in the pandemic, AI is prioritized alongside orderlies and workers in, in food processing. So for our main findings, first, Public investments in AI technologies primarily benefit um, the private sector. So government funding for AI goes mainly to industry and academia adjacent to industry, uh, where you have academia that often acts as an intermediary between industry and government. Indirectly, these funds can still benefit the for-profit organization. Uh, the focus for academia and AI is on capacity building for the private sector to do research in AI and train students to develop AI skills required by the workforce to support the economy. So it is worth questioning then how the innovation economy is influencing private power and by extension how AI public policy gets written. And this is because of public private uh, relationships and partnerships. Big tech is similar to big pharma, big oil, and big tobacco in the way it increasingly carries out lobbying activities to defend its interests. The close dynamic in between government and industry provides insight into the funding and investment processes behind AI. A sociologist and series speaker, Ruha Benjamin Apley writes that we should consider how private industry choices are in fact public policy decisions. This issue is amplified in that so much of AI resides in the private realm. So even though CIFAR made a commitment to civil society engagement, digital rights organizations, public interest advocacy groups, and indigenous groups are on the margins of AI decision-making. Um, interviewees recommended these organizations and groups to have a greater role in these decisions that are made around AI. Even though Canada has federal AI policy, there is no national government AI strategy. Uh, why is this, why does this matter? Well, it matters again, because it allows um, AI to be 
in the IT space rather than just AI uh, space, making it harder to um, create policy that can be regulated, can be used to regulate uh, the technology better. So the directive on ADM is itself only legally binding for federal government departments and agencies and the AI products created in-house or outsourced to private suppliers. Um, a legal framework for the federal government exists within this ADM, but not uh, ADM directive, but not subnational government. Um, and to this extent, it is true that Canada was the first to have a national AI research strategy with a specific focus on research and academic development. However, it's not a national government strategy. There are issues with the way um, ADM systems are used in and by government. Um, immigration, refugees, and citizens from Canada uh, ADM rate system raises concerns on procedural fairness and standard of review in cases of refugee and immigration applications. Um, in their report, Petra Molnar and Lex Gill state that the nuance and complex nature of many refugee and immigration claims may be lost on these technologies, leading to serious breaches of internationally and domestically protected human rights in the form of bias, discrimination, privacy breaches due to process and procedural fairness issues, among others. These systems will have life and death ramifications for ordinary people, many of whom are fleeing for their lives. In Quebec, the Ministry of Health and Social Services made it mandatory for youth protection services to use an AI software that sometimes generates reports contradicting the clinical judgment of the worker who often spends 15 hours meeting the child, parents, and professionals. In this one case, um, the ADM wrongfully predicted the urgency of care with no firmer, further human intervention, uh, resulting in the death of an infant. So given that we don't have any, jurisdictionally it's difficult, but there's no regulatory body to handle that case, uh, it's still an ongoing open case in Quebec. So again, led by CIFAR, the pan-Canadian AI research strategy is supported also financially in part by big tech and, and uh, Facebook and um, a commercial bank, RBC, alongside the government. So you have this government industry academia connection still going on. Um, and even though it was uh, the government invested $125 million, it's still uh, less than other international competitors. Okay, third, companies linked to human rights abuses can pre-qualify as government AI suppliers. So the Canadian government fails to exclude companies linked to human rights abuses from becoming vendors. Um, Pre-qualified AI supplier list includes at least one company with a known track record of causing or con contributing to human rights abuses. And that is Palantir Technologies, Inc. Palantir is also committed to the AIA. Palantir software programs created for the US Department of Homeland Securities, Immigration and Customs Enforcement, ICE, ICM and Falcon, enabled the government to identify, share information about, investigate and track migrants and asylum seekers to affect arrests and workplace rates. There is a high risk that Palantir contributed to human rights harms through the ways the company's technology facilitated the ICE operation. I recommend you read the report on uh, Palantir uh, from Amnesty USA. So just because it, this isn't happening in Canada, it doesn't mean that we shouldn't care about it. Um, an internal ethics framework for a company is insufficient to uh, make sure that a company is responsible and accountable and uh, does not abuse human rights. So corporations maximizing profits for their shareholders is nothing new. However, government partnering with a company linked to human rights abuses should cause concern. It also makes us question what does inclusive governance of AI look like? That's not just inclusive, but also accountable. So lastly, concentrations of power provide advantages to a handful of entities. 
You'd see financial resources, data, and technologies are concentrated in a few provinces, Quebec, BC, Ontario, universities and affiliated research nonprofits, startups, and international big tech companies. And there's also the specific innovation and intellectual property IP pools that are also being formed. Um, entities are organized as incubators or accelerators to build to support these startups and are often found in the public sphere as part of public universities under nonprofit legal status. Um, the lines between public and private interests become increasingly blurred with new formations of public-private partnerships and the revolving door phenomenon. And this leads me to question, are research ethics, practices, and, conf and conflict of interest policies sufficient mechanisms to ensure universities serve their purpose as public institutions? Well, so much in finding four. Um, so the majority of AI investments to go to specific universities and specific institutes and departments. So that's really, in Quebec, we could look at um, the funding announcement that went primarily to Université de Montréal, to McGill University, to Laval University, um, and to specific departments like computing science, engineering, and cybersecurity. The majority of federal government AI grants and contributions are funded by research institutions. Um, and notable investments have been made to produce a made in, AI, in Canada AI um, that federal government departments and agencies across the country can produce and use. Um, and yet we still see the AI ecosystem having in Canada having a lot of uh, foreign actors, especially investors. So on that note, Finding Four is about Silicon Valley and it's about acquisitions. Um, North Inc was acquired by Google um, and was heavily funded through grants by the Canadian government when it was under independent ownership. Um, and so we could see that um, it was a 20 million grant by ISAD that put it in the top entities to receive government contributions. Um, and the way AI companies show the uh, research investments translate into operations and real world use uh, by seeing how the, the acquisition kind of happened. And, you, and we have these patterns because just the, in November of last year, the same thing happened to Element AI. Uh, it was acquired by ServiceNow. And Element AI, it was definitely a company that was rooted for in Montreal, in Quebec, that was heavily funded by governments, both Quebec and the federal government that had strong ties to building public policy in Canada and doing responsible AI work. Um, but again, it was, uh, the acquisition happened, these patterns continue. So we see these ongoing patterns of creating business models that appeal to large tech companies uh, directly or indirectly uh, that is what ends up happening. Uh, governments and corporations invest heavily in AI R&D, but there's no formal reporting of such data for the development of AI metrics, for example. So, Canada is marketing itself as an innovator and leader on the global stage by using AI as a new driver to support the innovation economy. Um, we see that the Canadian governments are investing heavily in AI technology, first in industry and second in research institutions that support the design, deployment and implementation of AI products. But in reality is that the government and by extension the public is finding a big unknown. So a little bit to, to leave us to end this presentation and start the questions uh, section is, to think about what we need, uh, which is governments to keep companies accountable. We need governments to be accountable to the public. We need access, public scrutiny and independent oversight, um, as well as remembering that uh, this is a global responsibility uh, that we need to take on when building, procuring and using AI. This research has been a massive effort across uh, different continents and people and and time. And so um, these are just my two pages 
for people directly, like colleagues that I've been working with, researcher friends uh, that I've known for a long time, and also the interviewees who uh, you know gave me their time and their insight and knowledge uh, to help build this. Uh, so thank you. Um, any questions? Thank you so much, Anna, for such an exciting and rich presentation. There's so much to dig into both in your presentation and in your report. Um, I'll, I'll start off with a question to you, but I also want to remind everyone who's attending that you're welcome to ask questions in the Q&A box and we'll read them out loud. We just do this because we've had issues of Zoom bombing in the past, so I hope you um, understand. Um, so yeah, the Q&A box is just down there. Um, so yeah, so such a great presentation. Um, so something we were talking about a bit before the presentation um, was about how your process has changed um, over time, the research process and doing this. So I was hoping and answer this as you wish, but if you can talk a bit about your research process in doing this work and how your focus shifted over time. Sure. Uh, so I think First of all, I was, I'm just want to say that I'm in a very lucky position to be able to research what I want and to research funding. That's notoriously difficult to be able to do. And so I have a, a, a funder, an employer who lets me do that. Um, so even starting to be to think about like what I want to actually research uh, that hasn't been looked at as much or that I couldn't in my past lives um, was to look at funding, uh, but I, I guess I, I wanted to see what governance looked like. Of course, governance is nebulous, so it's hard to pinpoint it down. Um, but I was really interested in looking at industry, so I wanted to have a case study on FinTech, which is finance technology. Uh, however, that's like a whole new world for me. So as a researcher, it's easy to get in that world if you're an academic, because you're not a journalist, like you could end up working for industry. So uh, you know, before the pandemic, we had a lot of, luckily, a lot of free events and drinks and after hour things where you could meet people and, and connect. Um, but as soon as that went online, um, that changed, like any kind of doors I had open were not open anymore. Uh, and also it's just, um, becoming a part of that world uh, and absorbing it becomes uh, increasingly difficult when you come from a place that is that has such a different value system. Um, so I kind of zoomed out and thought, okay, I can look at public funding, I can look at government funding because we're in a country that has open government data. Uh, it's, it's pretty good. It's not like, you know, it could be better, but we have it why not just look at it to see what we can do with AI instead of um, not talking about how we're funding it? Because there are just very much like these broad numbers and these workshops, but no one actually talked about like where this stuff is going. How much does an AI project even cost like budgeted? I can tell you it's about 75,000 or 100,000. So I wanted to look at like sort of these like socioeconomical implications but also the way that it's actually valued in terms of not what AI can be but what it is um, and the way the government looks at it and especially because it links directly to this public accountability bit right so uh, yeah fine companies aren't accountable to the public but the government is so how can we make that connection stronger uh, so I went there instead of fintech which is just completely in industry and it's very close. Like there's just really difficult to even get that data um, out there and, and open. Even creating the AI ecosystem data set took me a very long time and that could be another conversation altogether. Fantastic, thank you so much. I just wanna remind people you can ask questions in the Q&A box, don't be shy. Um, in the meantime, I guess I'll ask another question. Um, hopefully people are typing away. Um, you presented so much rich material. Oh, there's already a question. Um, uh, so, oh, one of the questions so is from Mike asking about why does BC have so much AI grant funding? Um, is it because of Abcelera or are there other reasons? And maybe to also expand this question, um, 
maybe you can speak about some of your findings about why certain provinces, maybe is it that the provinces are marketing themselves in certain ways as well? Sure, yeah, so BC is definitely getting uh, the numbers so high because of uh, the super cluster initiative, which is actually surprising. Um, you don't hear BC being marketed the way Ontario and Quebec are. Again, that could be our, the algorithms no pun intended in the meta of that, but you know, like whatever I'm seeing versus you know, not being here in Montreal and not in, in BC somewhere. Um, but there's definitely that, you know, even within the AI labs, the three, Amy, Mila, and Vector, you see a fourth lab being created in at Simon Fraser University in Vancouver. Uh, so you're seeing the spread happening, but the sort of these, the way geographically, things are centered it's like the same old thing like the province uh like provinces that have gone funding historically are getting it again and you're seeing these sort of um inequalities replicated over time uh and again like some might argue that well the territories don't need funding because they don't have too many people but it's just uh, a little bit like well no, what are we doing to fund the territories with AI? Like, what are they going to do? Are, is there anything that's led or created um, geographically there, data centers that are there, data sets that are there? Um, what does that mean for ownership um, and inclusion and distribution of AI that's Canadian, let's say, which is also a questionable uh, statement. Thank you. Mira, do you want to read the question from Anonymous? Yeah, thank you for your amazing presentation, Anna. We have a question from a, an anonymous attendee. They are asking, what is the hopeful outcome of this work and what changes do you hope to see? Oh, good, uh, uh, <laughs> a hopeful question. Uh, so I guess back to my, my conclusion slide, slide is like one is I want people to take this and take the data set and do more, build more research on it and kind of put more awareness around funding and also like not be intimidated by financial data and data sets. I really wanna like mainstream having conversations about money, especially taxpayers' money. Um, and hopefully that could lead to a conversation around learning about policy because that's what got me to be like, okay, well, I need to understand the governance. So let's look at policy because it's very much parallel to funding and it it's those decision makers that call the shots. So um, what I hope is that, yeah, there's more research, public research done. Um, there's more like groups and organizations who um, can have a say in how these, these decisions get made um, and that the government can be, you know, publicly accountable to the people with the technologies that um, it, makes or it pays for uh, and somehow like we can you know my long-term wish is having the private sector have be equally accountable to the public I'm tired of the business model uh, that kind of replicates the same old thing and we really need to change that and part of that is you know procurement which sounds boring but uh, again can change many things if we have a say to change it so one of my wishes is like for everyone to be excited about procurement and find ways to like come back to the government and say how we can change things to, you know, not hire Palantir, not have them on the pre-qualified AI supplier list uh, and, and then others as well. Um, you know, it, it's beyond like we shouldn't get to the human rights abuses part for them to be problematic. Palantir is also problematic for its, uh, it, it, the way the data the way they manage uh, your data and the software it has. So Dana Boyd many years ago wrote this great response about it on this responsible data mailing forum um, that spoke about the way that the software wraps itself up around the data. So even if you download it, you can only, you as the government, you as the client can only download it in the way that it wants you to download it. You can never have a raw data set or the, the data itself, it has to be based on its features. So even that in itself, even if you own the platform, <laughs> they still own how that rolls out. So they're still in control. And it's about thinking about 
changing those patterns too, which are, which are harder, but more subtle and people don't speak about them enough. Thank you. Now we have lots of questions. <laughs> um, <Okay>. So, <laughs> so uh, Murad or Murad, I'm sorry if I mispronounced your name, asks, on the grants and contribution side, should there be strings, either equity stakes or other restrictions on funding to industry in order to preserve the public interest? The Strategic Innovation Fund, which the North, Absella, and Minebridge funding came from, for example, has job creation, R&D spending, and other target companies must meet, but they're all economic. Yeah, definitely. Uh, we need different sort of standards and also I would argue more like regulations around this uh, type of like the SIF. <laughs> um, and also like who, who even gets prioritized and how hard is it to apply for those grants? Cause that's another thing, same with procurement in general, like you uh, to, to even be able to create and participate and win, you know, create the RFPs and be a part of it and also be successful. You need to have a team, you need to have money to begin with. Uh, so what can the government do to even uh, support back to just even economically other players who just don't have the, the resources to do that or the time? So another anonymous attendee is asking, what do you think ISED, I said, funded, funded the Pan-Canadian AI strategy through CIFAR, a private unaccountable institute, and not NSERC, which is accountable with arm's length refereeing? Okay, um, good question. I can't speculate. All I do know is that CIFAR is public private. So it's one of those interesting sort of connections between universities and government. Um, it's from the 80s, so it's been around a while. Uh, I'm not sure how its own funding and organizational structure has changed or not. Um, I'm not sure that's a question I'll take back with me. Uh, and I encourage whoever is listening to investigate. Again, we need like more journalists on this. <laughs> we need more um, in investigative, uh, yeah, researchers uh, to look into it. So good question. I'm not sure. Thank you. Another anonymous attendee asks, can you say a bit more about the consequences in terms of policy, procurement, and oversight of AI not being in its own category and instead being subsumed under the IT label? I don't want to be cynical and say there are no consequences, but uh, the IT strategy just leaves it open to like AI being another digital tool. Uh, our prime minister called it that in ISED's mandate letter of 2019, uh, which again leaves it for broad interpretation. So me even looking at government grants and contributions specifically to AI words, maybe it's too specific and I like branch it out to the IT sector uh, uh, more broadly. Uh, so I would say it just makes it more difficult to move ahead. Like we had the AIA created, it's in version 0 0.8. We don't have a version one yet. We have the directive. Um, I mean, not everyone's on board with either of them necessarily. It's hard to know, like I haven't seen many updates around the process uh, and where they're at. And again, seeing how the IT strategy fits in with AI was leaves like way more room for um, you know interpretation because not just in terms of its categories but you end up going back to these sort of like big big tech big consulting firms uh, to end up getting a lot of these awards they're not all AI related but it's important to kind of see the same kind of patterns take place and then like not being able to break from that pattern. Like who else can we procure to? Like, you know, Deloitte just got another contract for COVID, basically kind of sole sourced or, you know, they meet all the specs because it's basically like made for them. How do we just not do that? Thanks, Anna. 
Mitch says, thank you for this presentation that is very rich in information and food for thought. You mentioned at the start that opacity is part of the funding landscape. There's also the fact that there are startups and mergers, so the ecosystem is evolving constantly. What could be a way to collectively keep track of this, an AI observatory? Or what could be other solutions to make more information accessible, which would be a prerequisite for accountability? Thank you for those questions. So I think uh, one major work of research going forward needs to be on looking at private investments um, to complement this work because so much of the opacity is still in terms of, like so much of AI is funded by the private sector. So we need to look at that. Like I'm looking, I'm giving you millions and like a few billions. This is like nothing compared to what's happening on the other side. And, and again, this is just the tip of the iceberg. So I would say that uh, we need more than an AI observatory. So building on that ecosystem data set that we've started uh, would be good to just kind of keep track of like who it even is there and also then going in being more elaborate about it and adding the sectors that they represent, where in the world are their headquarters, where else do they operate? Um, so it becomes more of like just Canada and becomes global really quickly. And that's kind of my, my thing back about Canadian AI is being, I don't know, it's, it's hard to bound these things geographically. So, but you do have um, entities uh, that are incorporated legally in countries and that's important. Uh, that's a different conversation. So I would say like sharing data sets, building on them. We have Open Data Day coming up on March 6th. I don't know if that would be interesting for people, um, but creating sort of like informal groups of people interested in just at least starting up with, starting out with Open Data, like Open Data is in the answer, but it's a, a step in the right direction. Um, and then going from there, I think there's definitely a missing piece in Canada, you know, in the US, you have AI Now Institute, you have Data and Society. We don't, we don't have that specifically for AI related stuff in Canada. I've mentioned uh, a few really amazing organizations and groups um, that are important to maybe also connect together to, to do some of that work. But again, um, so much of what's funded is in AI is for industry and for academia that like helps build industry. Um, how can we make that money, you know, how, how do we have funding uh, from government that's about advocacy uh, and about doing better for the public? Um, so yeah, many, many questions, some suggestions there as well. Thank you. Um, Fenwick asks, well, first Fenwick says, really fantastic talk. Um, and then writes, I'm thinking about Elman, how Elman AI sold to what's effectively a business surveillance company. I'm wondering in your research, if you have a sense of what problems AI proposes to solve or how it's being pitched to government to save what problems? I mean, that's difficult to answer in terms of um, me not being a lobbyist. Uh, I think maybe I should just be one for the public interest just to understand how those conversations work out. Uh, but yeah, basically ServiceNow is a surveillance uh, working company and I remember seeing their work a little bit while ago. And I remember also seeing one of Element AI's products that kind of looked like that. And so it wasn't, it was kind of a surprise, but not a surprise when I saw this acquisition coming. Um, I think back to the geopolitical aspect of it, so much of it is like, oh, Canada can be responsible AI leader. We can be, um, you know, leading best practices with AI and so on. And somehow we got set on the stage of, leading this global AI race. And politically, I guess it's an easy sell to say we need to invest in this stuff because China is, the US is, UK is. Then we have these strategic bilateral partnerships with and agreements with France, for example, and GPA is a really big one. It's interesting to see its founding members are everyone but China. Um, again, I think that really helps market this stuff and say that we need our own um, 
we need our own date, like we need our own startups, we need our own data centers and our own data sets, which is harder uh, to achieve uh, when again, so much of this is back to big tech and it feels like we're going around a circle. If, if our business model is Silicon Valley, how do we do it differently? If we're just gonna look at the economy and that competition. Thank you, Anna. Jason asks, over the course of your research, did you find agencies, departments, or corporations open to discussing this topic? Was there much pushback or attempt to hide the data? Oh, uh, well, good question and tricky question. So let's let me let, let me just go in my acknowledgments. So I actually had a lot of uh, openness from government uh, on both uh, the federal level and provincial, uh, which has been nice. I have gotten a few non-answers. I'm not sure if that's them not wanting to talk or being busy. Again, I started these interviews at the beginning of the pandemic. So I'm trying to be you know, kind and reasonable uh, to that. Um, there have been uh, a lot of interviewees that remain anonymous, a lot, at least some. And I respected that. Um, I've I've had um, a few industry representatives who I interviewed on their own behalf and not on behalf of their um, their or like corporation. Uh, so definitely, I would say that makes it more challenging. Um, yeah, I'll just I'll just put it out there. Element AI was a difficult person to get to, and I'm not the only one who has uh, said this. Um, if that helps or not, but I mean, now they're acquired by another entity, and it's like hundreds of millions of dollars. We're moving on. I want. I really, on that note, I'm curious to know what the the governments are going to take this moment to reflect on putting so much money in one company. Um, that then gets acquired, so derailed. I would say most most of them are open industry, where it's you know harder to to talk to. But at least I got people to to speak with on behalf of themselves. Uh, again, these are like probably standard responses in in this kind of research. So hopefully that answers your question. Thank you, Anna. Rob asks, Kathy O'Neill started an algorithmic audit firm, Orca. Have you seen any Canadian firms looking to provide alternatives to big accounting management consulting risk management practices? I have not, uh, but if they exist, please uh, bring them forward. Um, I know only Orca and Parity in the US. Um, I think there are about 20 or 30 that are like credible, um, which, whichever how you define credibility, but I do not. So if if any of you know know any, let, let me know. I'm interested to see where that can go forward in terms of like regulations and also creating standards for regulation in auditing. Great, and um, our last question, Megan is just thanking you for your presentation and also wondering um, if, uh, the people that watch this presentation can have access to the PowerPoint as Megan is interested in navigating the actor's map. And, yes. oh, and can I just add one thing to that too, is can you maybe speak a little bit about where and when the report will be available? And basically plug the report. <laughs> yeah, thank you. So uh, yes, the PowerPoints will be, uh, PowerPoint will be available. Um, the report will be launched next Monday on March 1st. Um, and there will be like more things around it. Another thing that will be launched, I can't say, um, but I can also tell you a little bit about the other future things I have. Please, please do, if you okay. like to so, so there's a couple workshops um, I invite you all to. Uh, one is for the Craft Fact Conference, which is the Fairness, Accountability, and Transparency Conference. Um, it's the specific day on critiquing and rethinking uh, accountability, fairness, and transparency. Um, and this is going to be a session that I organized uh, with Renee Sieber on the civic empowerment in the development and deployment of AI systems. 
Um, it's part of the AI for the rest of us project uh, that we're doing. There's also a workshop coming up, and this is on March 5th, next Friday. There's a workshop coming up at Mozilla Festival on March 15th uh, on how to make open data standards more inclusive with Silvana Fumega and Miko Canares. Um, and I have an essay on facial recognition technology and surveillance uh, co-authored with Johan Stevens uh, for the Center for Media Technology and Democracy that's coming out hopefully next month as well. Amazing. And we're happy to share on our social media any links that you want us to share. Um, so I'll, I'll get those from you after uh, the talk and we'll share those. And also uh, the recording will be on our website within a week. Just give us a week, we need to make sure the captions are all synced. Um, and you can also find past events, which Anna referenced as well. So thank you for that. Uh, thank you everyone so much for coming. It was lovely to share this event with you. Thank you so much, Anna. Thank you to our captionist, Nikki, and thank you, Mira, uh, for help running the tech on this. So thank you everyone so much. Thank okay. you, thanks so much. <laughs>